Welcome to the way part six, the way to the cross. As we continue in our sermon series, the way the early church was simply called the way they followed the ways of Jesus, his teaching and the way that he lived. And so we've been looking at the gospel of Mark at what Jesus has been teaching at what Jesus has been doing. And today we move into chapter 11 in the gospel of Mark. And we celebrate Palm Sunday and the story of people celebrating Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be encountered, your forgiveness experienced, and that your love would lead the way. Amen. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That would be great for driving in Tennessee, if you could ever drive in a straight line. I didn't know until I went out and visited the Midwest that they could lay out roads just like a perfect sort of grid where roads could run north and south of exactly almost in east and west. Because in Tennessee, you have to turn, you have to twist, and then you're never quite sure what direction you're headed. So we need maps. When I, back in my day, I always loved that. Back in my day, we had maps. We had atlases. We had state maps. We had city maps. You would shove these things in your glove compartment or store them in your trunk, bust them out anytime you needed them. And then we got computers and computers that could give us directions before we ever left. But we had to print those out because we couldn't take that computer with us. MapQuest and others. So we would have those directions with us. And you hope there's no weird detour or construction on the way. And then we got now maps that go with us and update as we go. There's too much traffic ahead, so we get rerouted, and our maps gives us the fastest way there. But you have to know, no matter whether you're using a map in the old days or using um, Google Maps now or whatever or a GPS system built into your car, you have to know your destination. And I want to start there because as we tell this story and retell this story and recount and relive this story of Jesus riding the donkey or the mule, the colt, depending on which gospel lesson you are reading, which whether it's Matthew or Mark or Luke, whichever one you're reading, as Jesus is riding and palm branches are spread, you can't fully understand this story unless you understand where Jesus is headed. We've been in the Gospel of Mark now um, for a couple months, and we Jesus has told us where he is headed, and the disciples haven't gotten it yet. They don't get the destination, but we sit on this side of the cross and this side of the resurrection, and as Mark tells this story to us and reminds us of the importance of this final week of Jesus' life and what it means for us as people of faith, there is so much in these 11 verses. So much that Mark packs. I mean, he tells the story quickly, but he packs so much into these 11 verses for us to know what Jesus was about, what Jesus was doing. And it starts as Jesus looks at two of his disciples and says, go get me the colt, the colt that is unridden, untie it and bring it to me. If anybody stops you, just tell them I need it and they'll let you go. They go and they do that. That happens. And then Jesus gets on this colt that's never been ridden before and rides into Jerusalem. It's interesting that we start right there. Why a colt? Why a mule? Why a, a donkey and not a horse? Horses were instruments of war and basically only ridden for war. And so a military leader might ride a war horse into town. But somebody else, any other kind of leader, would ride a donkey. It wasn't uncommon for them to ride a donkey. It's not that a donkey is less than a horse. It's just that horses were basically only ridden then as instruments for war. But a work animal, that's very different. And so careful to be told that Jesus chose not the war horse. This is not a revolution to overthrow the Roman government by military force. This is not a takeover of the world by God by military force or might, but a working, loving effort, a labor of love. So Jesus chooses the animal of labor 
and rides into town, into Jerusalem on a mule. It's also interesting that it is an unridden mule. To get the full concept of this, you have to understand who Jesus is in the line of David and understand secession and the story from 1 Kings chapter 1. David is dying. And who's going to become the next king? David chooses Solomon to become the next king. And so they put Solomon on David's mule, the one King David would ride on, and declare him as the next king in the line of David. And so we're going to get into that, that Jesus is in the line of David and the coming of the kingdom of David when people are shouting. But understand in this secession story, because Jesus is in the line of David, people expect him to be just like King David. So when that secession pattern continues to Solomon, as David passes on the dynasty to Solomon, Solomon rides David's mule. It has been ridden before. So it's a continuation of David's dynasty. When Jesus chooses to ride an unridden colt, yes, he is in the line of David. Yes, he is the Messiah. Yes, he is the anointed one and chosen one of God. And there will be some similarities. But this is not just the old king is dead, the new king is here. It's a new kingdom. It's an and then, it's an addition. It is not the campaign to make Jerusalem great again to what it was 600 years earlier. When he chooses, as Mark tells us, the unridden cult, it's Jesus' way of telling us that he is ushering in a whole new era, a whole new time, a whole new kingdom, not completely separate from the last kingdom, still living with that heritage and that tradition of God and God's people, but it won't be what it was 600 years ago. It will be different. And the people shouting Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. These are people, as we've talked about over the last couple months, living in an occupied territory, oppressed by the Romans. And as they cry out, when Jesus is riding into town, Jesus, save us. Hosanna, save us, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Meaning they recognize that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is king. He is anointed to be king. But we also learn that anointing wasn't just as God's chosen king but that he was also then in Mark chapter 14, which we're going to get to um, coming up if you were reading the gospel of Mark with us, anointed for death. He is on the way to the cross. So as they are crying, save us, they look at it as the new king, like in King David, and just throw the Romans out. But Jesus rides in, and he is the Savior but it is different. It's not in the way that we, they would have expected as they spread those palm branches, as they laid out their coats. And they would say blessings at the coming of the king of David, of David's kingdom. Yes, God will bless Jesus as king of kings. But it's not just the same as David's kingdom, because it's not David's kingdom. Jesus has tried to work with the teachers, the Pharisees, and the scribes and help them understand it is not David's kingdom. It is God's kingdom, and it is God's way. And sometimes that's very different from our own ways. And we might expect as Jesus rides into town that he's headed to the temple, and Mark tells us he rode into Jerusalem and he went to the temple, right? The place we would expect the Messiah, the Son of God to go. But he looked around and didn't stay long. It was evening. But he also didn't have to stay long because this was not his ultimate destination. 
he will be back in the next couple days, which we already said. We're taking a step back. We were all the way up to Mark chapter 13, and we had taken back to Mark 11 so we can celebrate Palm Sunday. And he will be there teaching and arguing and helping folks see the kingdom of God is different. It is just different. It's not a way of military might. It is a way of transforming love, of light versus darkness, of love versus hate. It is a way of living, not for the self, but as Jesus would say over and over to his disciples, it's a way of serving, not being served. It is a way of denying yourself or dying to yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross, the instrument of death. Die to yourself and follow me. Love God. Love neighbor. It's the recurring theme in all of the Gospels, but it's so focused here in the Gospel of Mark that as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, this will be not a regular war. He is not going to rule by force. He rules with love. He rules with service. He rules with giving himself away completely. And that's the example that he lays down for us. Giving ourselves away, dying to ourselves, and living for God and serving our neighbors. When we cry out today that, Hosanna, God, save us, save us. Maybe we should be offering ourselves as the instruments to God do, for God to do the saving. Let me say that again. As we cry out for God to save us, especially in these strange times of quarantine, of shelter in place, of stay at home, of folks losing jobs in these crazy days, we've never lived through anything like this, that we might throw our hands up like they did when Jesus rose rode into Jerusalem and say, God, save us. But maybe, just maybe, as we give ourselves away, yes, I'm saying we, we still follow all the directives, right, for our community to keep ourselves safe, but not for ourselves, but to keep everyone around us as safe as possible. Maybe when we shout out, God, save us, maybe we should add that prayer, save us and help us Use us to save others. That's the way of Jesus, of giving yourself away. Like the folks continuing to work, our mechanics, our nurses and doctors, our folks in the grocery stores, our sanitation workers, everybody in those essential services, giving themselves away, helping our neighbors who have lost jobs, who can't work, who don't have the next paycheck and don't know when there will be a next paycheck, continuing to reach out and love one another. This is the invitation and challenge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it shows up again and again that we deny ourselves, take up the cross, the instrument of death, right? our own self-desires, our own needs. Lay those aside and follow Jesus. And when we follow Jesus, that is always to the cross. It is always the fullness of giving ourselves away for the sake of God's kingdom because our neighbor needs it. As Luther would say, God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. And as Pastor Delmer Chilton would say, it's easy to like Jesus, but it's hard to be like Jesus. You are invited on the way to be like Jesus. You are invited and challenged to serve your neighbor. Amen.